Hey everybody, I want to remind you of the different ways that you could send your tithes and your offering. You could do it through texting. If you don't have access to Google Play or the App Store, just send a text to 601-273-4609 and send it to the word GIVE. After that, you'll receive a text message back and then just follow the simple instructions, the simple steps, and you're all set up. Also, you can use the Tidely app. Just download the app from the Google Play or the App Store, and you can set up the amount that you want to give, and you can send it to Springs of Praise World Outreach Center, or you can mail it to Post Office Box 549, Crystal Springs, Mississippi, 39059. If you want to drop it off at the uh, church office, the office is open Tuesdays through Thursdays from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. And as always, I want to thank you for watching this program. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> I'm just a newsman. I mean, I'm the, the uh, uh, postman. I just deliver what has been given to me, and today is a little skimpy. And this is all the Lord gave me, a little simple thing to do. And we're going to culminate it, end it in prayer up here. Okay, so that's it. Now, let's read our scripture. We're taking back the middle ground. I sense it getting stronger and stronger week by week. As I come into this sanctuary and spend time in here praying by myself, I feel like the Lord is saying, I've got this snowball going. About... Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Start with but and say it with me. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Join me again. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Father, bless the reading of your word and let this penetrate our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to somebody beside you and say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Open your ears. You're about to hear something. Amen. Of the important things in your life, church, being affiliated with a group of people, connected to a body, is a, one of the top priorities of your life. Am I right? For you that are here, that not, must be the case. And next to that, secondly, as a priority, is your family. Is that right? I mean, church, above it, more important, is your family? Absolutely. Your family is more important than this church. That's the way it was set up. That's why what happens in your home affects what happens here. The first institution was not a church. It was the family. So that's your second priority. But did you know what your number one priority is? Prayer. Did you know the number one priority in your life is praying? Why? Because it's simply communicating with the number one being in your life. You're just talking. It's like a phone. It's a way of communicating. You communicate to numero uno, Johnny. He is to be number one. Do you agree with that? God's to be number one. Amen. And prayer is the method that he chose to use in your life and mine to talk with him. Now, I, we have problems with prayer, and I understand that. I, 
I, I feel the seriousness of this prayer sometimes can be counterbalanced with cartoons. Calvin and Hobbes. Have you ever read Calvin and Hobbes, the comic strip? I thought it was kind of funny. Now, this is almost sacrilegious, but I'll, I'll share this. Calvin and Hobbes. And here's the, the little blocks of captions of the cartoon that goes. And it shows a little boy standing outside holding his sled. And it's this month toward the end of November. And he's looking for snow. Got that sled. He's looking down at brown grass. But the whole time he's looking... He's talking to God, and he makes this conversation. If I had my way, we wouldn't see brown grass from October to May. And he looks further up into the heavens, and he says, okay, on the count of three, are you ready? One, two, three, snow! Nothing happens. And he gets a little upset about it. And he says, I said, snow. Come on, snow. He gets a little perturbed. He raises his fist. Snow. All right then. Don't snow. See if I care. I like this weather. Let's just have it all the time. Well, his rebellion doesn't last too long, and the next scene, it's got him on his knees. And he's saying, please, snow, please. Could I have a foot? Okay. Eight inches. Okay. Six. At least six. Nothing happens. In the next little clip, it has him running around in a circle with his fist clenched, his head down, using a vocabulary word that is not in your dictionary that most parents have heard from their kids. And when he finally expends his energy and his strength and he's, he, his prayer is not answered, there's no snow, he looks up with the most desperate look and says, do you want me to become an atheist? <laughs> and the clip is over. Now, you know, we laugh at that. It's almost sacrilegious. But, you know, and the truth of the matter is, that's us. Yeah. Maybe we didn't pray for snow. Maybe it was something a lot more serious than snow. But when you didn't get it, you didn't say, God, if you don't answer this, I'm going to become an outright atheist. We're through. You didn't say that. No, but you walked away from that experience yes, with a pain in your heart and a disappointment that's kept you from ever really getting close to him since. The, the problem with prayer is this. We don't know that the intric intricacies of prayer that in order to get A done, you've got to go B, C, D, e, F, G, and you've got to get all these things lined up in order to get this done. We just simply pour out a request and don't realize behind the scenes, when you watch a movie, it isn't the man and the woman that's in, in the main actors that, that really makes that movie. It's that screen artist. It's those people shooting the cameras, it's all the behind the scenes that really make that thing work. And can I tell you, in prayer, it isn't just you say something and it's going to happen. God has to be behind the scenes working in order to get that thing accomplished. Do we all see that? And a lot of times that can be a lot of different intricate things involved. That's why I love this text that we just read. Would you put back up verse 5 for me? I love this because... You have here in, in this scripture something the Bible rarely does. Very seldom do you have this in chapter, verse 5. It's doing up there what you do when you go to your computer 
And what some people will do today, because they have the television to do it, and that's it, you're going to pull up the Saints. Or no, they're playing Monday night, aren't they? And you're pulling up one game, and right beside you, you're pulling up a second game, sometimes a third or fourth. But you've got at least two screens going up there on your computer or on your TV. You're watching two things at the same time, simultaneously. And that's what's going on here. At the same time, God pulls back the screen and says, I'm going to show you two things happening at the same time. Very seldom in Scripture do you find that. So what's the two scenes on our computer? Number one is a prison. We're watching the insides of a prison and what's going to go on there. And we're watching a house. Now in the prison... We know that it says that he was put between four quadrants of soldiers. That means that Peter was arrested and taken with 16, quadrant is 16, quadrant, uh, 16 men. What's Peter going to do? He's a short fellow anyway. He may be a little fiery, but he can't handle They give him 16 soldiers, and they got him in the inner part of the prison to really protect him. But... The second scene goes to the house. But prayer with what? In the house, something's going on. In the prison, the soldiers, the demands, the government. You have all this, but in the house, all you got is a bunch of Christians bowing on their knee before God with their face in their hands, just talking to God. Amen. If you look at the two scenes, the prison... The soldiers, the might, the spears, the swords, the government officials, it looks like they got it all. And in the house, they look outmanned, outnumbered, outclassed, out everything. But what is happening in the house is having an impact on that prison. Things are about to change in that prison not because they had political might, not because they had military might, not because they had financial might and could pay somebody off, but because they had the might in Almighty God. And when they prayed what looked like a simple thing, bowing your knee and praying, what power could there be in such a simple thing? But it moves the hand of God that turns that situation around. Yes. Yes. And we're given the scene of both things. Why is that important? Because usually when you're praying, you don't get to look in the next room. Usually when you're praying, you don't know that cotton-picking anything is happening in the next room or the location that you're praying. But what you do when you know God and you know prayer, you determine something. I can't see what's going on. When I go up to Newt's and I order me a pizza, I can't see after I've paid my bill. All they give me is a little slip of paper with a number on it and have me put it on that little stick and I'm sitting there and I've got my tea over there and I'm, sit, I'm, I'm sitting relaxing. Why? Because I have faith that back behind the scenes somebody making my pizza. And if somebody comes up by me and says, you're not getting a pizza. Oh, yes, I am. How do you know you're getting a pizza? Because I have the evidence of things unseen right here on my little table. I paid for it. I got my evidence. And my pizza's coming my way. That's what it takes when you believe God. You can't see Him making the thing happen. You can't see what's going on. But you determine, I'm going to pray anyway. Even when I don't know it's working. Even when I don't feel like it's working, the song says. He's working anyway behind the scenes. Because... Only God knows what's going on in the next room. And so they pray. What kind of prayer is this? This is not nice platitudes. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It is not textbook praying. It's not now I lay me down to sleep praying. These people feel like they have got to get a hold of God. Yes. On this Sunday, two days 
before America could go to hell. Do you think we ought to have a little desperation in our heart? Okay, sirrah, sirrah. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If they had had that attitude, Peter would have got his head cut off just like James. Jesus, Jesus. We can do something about it. We can pray today, but we can meet tonight and say, we want our country back. Yes, amen. Give us our country. Come on. If, if you want to give it to the devil, then just go ahead and stay home tonight. Don't vote on Tuesday. Because there's somebody in that office, one of those offices, I'll not name his name, starts with a B. But anyway, need to get him out. We need some conservative people that are willing to get this man out of office. Oh, yes. man. Yes. oh well, okay, here we go. We do need When you get desperate like the church but prayer was made without ceasing unto God for Him. When you get that desperate, many times what you have is you've got an order. I'll have to look it up because I put it up here. Separation, anxiety, order. Everyone say it with me. Separation, Separation anxiety, 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 disorder. disorder. Separation, anxiety, disorder. You say, what's that got to do with this whole scene? I'll tell you, separation, anxiety, disorder is something that happens primarily to children, but it can happen to adults and does happen to adults as well. It's simply a disorder that, sep that does this. When that child is separated from the primary caregiver, usually a parent, sometimes it may be someone else, but usually the parent leaves and the child separated from that, that love. What you can do if you have a child like that is you can feed them a bottle. You can rock them. You can make sure the diaper's dry and they won't stop crying. The reason they won't stop crying is not because of something physical, it's something emotional. They sense and they know that the one they love has left them and they won't be comforted. It's an adult that has someone in their life that they will not be without. I can't do without you. You can't do without them. And you have this disorder. It's, 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 it's a separation. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, are you separated? <laughs> are, you, are you separated? Oh, I'm separated from my notes. I need this. Lord Jesus, stick a prayer for me right now. I sense I'm fighting an uphill battle in this room. I, I sense it. Devil, I, I sense this. Oh, it's all right. Okay, now I'm on back on track. It's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. If you're watching us by way of the channel, preachers sometimes get lost. But there are, diff there are reasons sometimes. We sense in the spirit realm that we're fighting something in the room. We sensed it during worship. There's something in this room right now that does not want there to be a breakthrough. And I'm claiming a breakthrough for you that are listening and for these people right here. The reason why this was a separation anxiety disorder that was going on in that church is because we have a baby church. It had just been born out of the bleeding side of Jesus. And no sooner had he given birth to it, just prior to Pentecost, ten days later, we have Pentecost, the birth of the church, and he just left. How would you like for your mother to give you birth at one of these hospitals and walk out and say, I'm leaving? Jesus did it. Jesus gives birth to the church and says, I'm leaving. I mean, uh, cloud's coming for me. I'm out of here. Don't know when I'll be back again, but I'm leaving. And I tell you who I'm going to put in charge. I'm putting Peter in charge. Peter is going to be the foundation rock. Not the rock that the church is built on, but Petra, a little rock. When he's going to give the keys to the kingdom to the Jews, he's going to give the keys to the kingdom to the Gentiles. So I'm giving it to Peter. And Peter is who you're going to lean on. Well, now Peter is in jail and James has just got it. <laughs> And it looked like Peter's gone. What is this church feeling? 
I tell you what they're feeling. These people, most of them got saved underneath Peter's ministry on the day of Pentecost. They were baptized, brought in, and been given the milk of the word. Peter wrote that later in 1 Peter chapter 2, give them the sincere milk of the word. He's given them the milk of the word. He's their mentor. He's their leader. They had Jesus that left them. And he's, they got Peter now, and Peter's leaving. My Lord, it's happening all over again. Jesus left us. Now Peter's leaving us. I'm looking at some folks in this room that understand it's happening all over again. I went through the trauma a year or two ago of going through this difficulty in my life, but it's happening all over again. I went through COVID and sickness. I was in the hospital and now it seems like I can't get rid of sickness. It just keeps coming. It's happening all over again. On my second marriage. But it's happening all over again. On my third job. But it's happening all over again. I thought my child was free from drugs and alcohol. But I just found out something and it's happening all over again. Me and my spouse, we thought it worked it out. But now the problem's back. It's all over again. How many people in this room have the same problem that keeps coming back again and again, year after year, and you fight the same old devil again and again? You get tired of it. And the church was tired of it. Jesus left us, and we're getting a hold of God because Peter's not leaving. We're sticking our heels in the ground and we're going to get a prayer through to heaven and we're going to pray. This is not one of your 20 minute prayers. This is not what you get your, your, your book out that you've been journaling in and read your journal. No, this is I got to get a hold of the horns of the altar. I got to get a hold of God. America needs God today. I tell you, on Tuesday, we need God. We need God. And I tell you what, if things don't turn around Tuesday, I can guarantee you this thing will go to hell quicker than you can you right. snap a finger. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Did God hear? We wouldn't be so upset about stopping God. They stopped God from being prayed to in the school. We wouldn't be so upset about that. I'm, I hate that. But we wouldn't be so upset if we knew that how good God hears. You can put tape over my mouth and sew my lips shut and I can pray a prayer that will get through to God just like Jonah's prayer in the bottom of an ocean in the belly of a whale. God can hear pretty good. Yes. Amen. Amen. They, it, they, they were heard and God dispatched an angel. In the scene, we have two scenes. We have the one scene, the house where they're praying. Doesn't look like in the eyes of the world, there's nothing going on there. Over here is where the action is. But this group right up here begins to move things around. And God dispatches an angel. And you know what that angel does? All right. He opens doors. The Bible says they were all locked with soldiers guarding them. And he opens doors. Long before we had you stepping in front of a sliding door, the angel had that gate just <laughs> open right up. Mm -hmm. Peter goes through one door after another, finally to the gates and through open gates and finds only one door the angel cannot open for him. The one door is the door to the church. Ain't that funny? All the enemy's doors are open, but the door to the church, the angel can't open. Because no matter how much you pray, there are some things that have to have action with it. You've got to, you see, that church forgot something. He's knocking on the door and Rhoda go, goes to the door uh, and, and doesn't answer. She hears his voice, but she doesn't answer. 
and the church doesn't believe that he's out there. Hey, number one, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. You've got to believe that you're going to get the answer. If you don't believe you're going to get the answer before you ever see the answer, you're never going to get the answer. It'll never manifest. Am I telling it like it is? Jack Cole was an evangelist of the 1950s, and they brought to him five men who were quadriplegic and paraplegic. They could not walk. They were wheeled in. He saw them. He said, go home. He told them, go home. He'd be very blunt. Go home. You came in here without shoes. Not one of them had a shoe on. You get some shoes, you come back, and we'll pray for you. They all brought shoes with them. They all walked out of those shoes. Because Jack Cole says, if you're not anticipating and expecting that when I pray for you, things are going to happen, then you're never going to get anything. You've got to believe that you receive, then you'll have it. Amen. I think that that church forgot the key, key, key thing to prayer. They were praying and believing and bombarding heaven and doing the right thing, but they left one element out. You've got to believe that you receive when you're praying. I'm going to get this. I'm going to see it done. We're going to pray America back into the place it once was. Bring revival back to the land. We've got to believe it when we come out of this building tonight and there's no bombs bursting. There's nothing happening. It looks like a little power was released. But we've got to believe it in my heart. If I pray and I assault the doors of heaven, something's going to happen somewhere else in another location because I pray. Yeah. That's why this verse of Scripture is important. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 1. Thank you, Chris. Read it for me. First three words. Sing, barren woman. Sing! Who? Barren woman. You who never bore a child. Burst into song. Shout for joy. Now isn't that strange? Here's a barren woman wanting to have kids. And he says, I want to give you some instructions, lady. You can't have kids. It seems like you haven't been able to have kids. But let me tell you what to do. You need to sing. And you don't need just to sing. You need to shout aloud. Do you know what the word shout means? It's the word for scream. It's the exact same word that was used by the disciples when they saw Jesus walking on the water and they thought he was a ghost. And the Bible says those little men, like little girls, screamed. They just screamed. Oh, it's a ghost. They screamed. Well, that's the exact word. He says, barren woman, you need to do two things. You need to start singing, and you need to start screaming. What kind of scream is it? It's a shout of joy. It's the same scream. Woo! Well, you just won $140 million in the lottery. You know, they opened up the door and they got the camera right on. What, how do you feel? Woo! Woo! Tell it again. Speak it again. Woo! They don't know what to say. They just, that's a scream of joy. It's the price is right. And the curtain, they just won everything behind the curtain. And the, the, the vacation and the bow and everything. Woo-ha! Now that's strange. That he's saying, I'll be giving you some expressions that you need to have. Who? To a barren woman who's never bore a child. I'm giving this to you because something's about to happen to you. You're going to start bearing more than the woman that's got a husband and she's been having all kinds of kids. Did you know that in every one of our lives in here, listen to me, this is important. Every one of our lives in here, and you that are listening, have a barren place in your life. A place where you're not producing. A place where that you feel empty and dry and dead on the inside concerning that thing. There are barren places in our life that he's addressing here. And he says, here's what I want you to do about it. I'm going to give you further instructions. Number one, sing. Everybody say sing. Sing. In just a moment, we're going to do this. Number two, I want you to shout for joy. Say shout. Shout. For For joy. joy. Scream it out. We're going to do it in a minute. But he gives you a third thing. Notice what he says in verse two. Enlarge the place of your tent. 
Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Do not hold back. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. He says, what will it look like when you start having kids? What are you going to have to do? You're going to have to start making arrangements. In other words, lady, I want you to start structuring for growth in the midst of your barrenness when there's not one sign, you've not taken a test, you don't know I've got that pregnancy test and I can take it. No, you don't know you're pregnant. You don't, you, all you know is you're still barren and you don't have children. But I want you to start enlarging your tents. I want you to start building and enlarging and getting ready for the kids that are coming your way. It's going to take an act of faith because you can't see it. But I want you to start anticipating what's going to happen to you. Begin singing about it. I remember in uh, uh, nine months before November 4th, 1980, my wife came out of the bedroom with tears in her eyes. We've been married almost nine years and wanted children. She said, God spoke to me tonight and gave me a verse of Scripture. I said, what did He give you? Single, barren, and begin to shout for joy because something's about to happen to you. And my wife began to sew together and knew it was going to be a boy and began to sew together little boy items before she even was pregnant according to man. I'm telling you, there's something down inside of you when you know that you know that you know God's about to enlarge me. God's about to cause me to have some children. Come on, somebody! Stand to your feet. Is it worth the pain? Oh, God. America is the home I love. I'm so sad in my heart of where she's gone. Forgive us, Lord. We've sinned grievously against you. Oh God, have mercy upon us all. Because what judgment falls on Washington, D.C. affects us. Oh God! Uh, you know when you really get to praying, it can be painful. When I really get to praying, I feel like my gut is nodding up. And a lot of times I'm groaning, oh... Oh, oh God, is it worth the pain? Well, if I took you to Jackson, to different floors and different hospitals, and I showed you some women breathing in pain, screaming every now and then, the obvious problem is there. Their belly looks like an inflated balloon about to bust. Taut skin. If the diagnosis was cancer, it would be a sad place. But when the diagnosis is a baby, grandpa and grandma, mom and dad, aunts and uncles are outside and they all tickle. <laughs> She's not real tickled. She's in the pain. But they're excited because the end is joy. The pain is worth it if the end is joy. I have one scripture to read to you. If I can find it. It's in Isaiah 65, verse 8. Listen to my verse. This hit me like a ton of bricks yesterday. Isaiah 65, 8. The new wine is found in the cluster. The new wine is found in the cluster. God's been promising this church new wine, new wine skin. Where's it found? It's found in the cluster. It's found in the coming together, in the group. I feel like these Sunday night services have been ordained by God. Do I feel something every Sunday night mostly? But when I don't, I don't worry about it. Because if we do it 
Deborah, the new wine is found in the cluster. Say it with me. The new wine is found in the cluster. Let's say it again. The new wine, what we want, is found. It's found in the cluster. It's found in the, the gathering, the corporate meeting. As we come together, new wine will flow in this place. So I have no doubt about it. Here's what I want to ask you while Gene gets ready to play something. We played a little earlier. It's our opening song. But I, I want to ask you this. Is there a barren place in your life where you once had fruitfulness? Not, not there now. Are you dry? Uh, are you, is the Holy Ghost kind of stagnant inside of you? Or, or you've been praying for something and you've been believing for it, but it just seems like you can never get the answer. And you feel like that, that area, I'm barren, I can't get any results. Do you know how long it's been since we've had someone really genuinely, I, I, we have people that cry a little bit, but I mean someone that we can point at and say, there was a genuine experience of salvation at that altar where they really received Christ. The, I got to thinking about it. We have not had anybody that I can remember. You may jog my memory, but I'm the pastor and usually I can remember things. I don't think in the last two years and possibly three years that we've had a real Holy Ghost, real sure enough, Conversion. You kind of barren, ain't you? Yeah, boy, dry. Whew. I was in Colorado one time and went over to the altar and raked, raked my hands on it, and I got a cake of dust. And one of the young men was there with us. Uh, the pastor wasn't there, but I said, What's this? He said, Oh, we haven't had an altar call in our church for 10 years. Yeah, I knew that when I preached. Dead, dry, dusty, nothing there. Finally closed it down. You don't get fruit at these altars. Eventually, you might as well shut us down. We're not overflowing with people today anyway. Can we get real? The pastor of this church stands before God accountable and scares the life out of me because for many years I did not promote prayer like God's saying. Today I said, God, I want to preach something else because what I'm sharing is going to be so simple. And, so, and the Lord spoke to my heart, really spoke to me and said, I've given you an assignment. Even though you feel like you've preached everything you can on prayer, find something else and keep preaching it. I mean, I was, I was thumbing through my notes trying to come up with something, and all of a sudden I came across this passage, and I, I thought, okay, there it is. Ain't much. We would just give what we got. Two locations, but one moves the other. One's got the power. The other one doesn't. The one that's got the power don't look like they got the power, but they got the power.